You People Are Nuts by George Hepner, an audiobook. Chapter 1 The Diseased Mind of Self Absorbed Youth. The old timers were absolutely correct, no matter what period of time they lived in. If you spend your time being idle, enjoying luxury instead of doing something useful with your life, you're going to end up anxious and depressed due to that idleness. People like that are often hypochondriacs. They're never satisfied with anything that they have, and they spend a lot of time making those with any intelligence or decency look bad. The human mind, heart, and body were never designed to be inactive, just like a car is not designed to be inactive. Like a car that's left to be idle too long, the human being that stays idle sort of breaks down and becomes non-functional. Of course, a car that breaks down just doesn't work when you need it to. When a human being breaks down due to that inactivity, it often just doesn't want to work. It gets used to that idleness and wants to stay that way. And too many words come out of the mouth. You can always tell a lack of wisdom by the amount of useless talking that a person does. The emptier that person is on the inside, the more talking they do on the outside. That was no more perfectly exemplified than the 18th episode of the fourth season of Seinfeld. In that story, Elaine had gotten involved with an agency that spent time with elderly folks around Manhattan, so George and Jerry decided to get involved too. The episode starts off with George and Jerry sitting at the coffee shop, and George is being his usual complaining self. He was talking about how when he dates, he doesn't like the ones that like him, and when, they like, when he likes them, they don't like him. Both were talking about how there had to be more to life than what they were just experiencing. George's exact words were, There's a void, Jerry. There's a void. He said it right. Darkness that comes from a wasted life spent on frivolity, selfishness, and evil leaves a person feeling empty. Darkness, which is also known as unconsciousness because it is a lack of light and intelligence, needs to be filled with moral action in life. George and his friends were guilty of many selfish acts and many selfish forms of behavior, which they felt they never had to answer for. Seinfeld was lauded as a show that made people laugh, which was about nothing. They often went back and forth with frivolous musings that were hilarious, even when the evil acts were portrayed in a comical light. It's never funny in real life. The fact is, the show was one of the worst forms of propaganda against the human race itself. The show was actually about evil and selfish behavior, but since powerful people like to say good and evil don't exist, the evil behavior on the show was constantly referred to as nothing. It was a way of making evil behavior seem like the only option in life, and it made good, symbolized by the clumsy and offbeat character of Kramer, seem insane. The unspoken idea was, mm, good and evil don't exist in life, but if good existed, which it doesn't, it would be too stupid and crazy to bother with. So, after George got the idea of, quote, helping people, in this visiting the elderly folks from Elaine, he said, of course, it all makes sense, helping people, this is what my life is missing. Fact is, George was a whining, neurotic, backbiting, selfish jerk who was waiting for life to somehow please him, which wasn't possible. When he had a job, he often did little to no work. The only reason he got dates was he lived in a time when women expected men to be hollowed out shells who exhibit no masculine aspects while women bossed them around, which was done to make up for thousands of years of male domination. He often did whatever he wanted, and every time the consequences would come his way, he would do anything he had to in order to not face them. Even though he was now going to try and do something nice for others in order to feel better about himself, he was doing it for the wrong reasons. In Hermetic philosophy, there's a principle known as polarity, which states, among other things, that all things have aspects of their opposite within themselves. In every act of unselfishness, there's a little selfishness. You do things to help others primarily, but you also do them to feel good about yourself. Just because there is a small amount of selfishness in an unselfish act doesn't make it evil. That small amount of selfishness can't be avoided. It shouldn't be avoided. Love of other human beings causes us to love ourselves more, because human beings are one species and race. Like the yin and yang symbol shows, there's a little bit of opposite in everything. It's just the way the universe is set up, and it shows that was spoken in the Colburn Bible was correct. Humanity lives in God, and God lives in humanity. To serve humanity is to serve God. If you put in a sincere effort, you serve adequately. George was doing this for the purpose of making himself feel good, not to help anyone else. 
His childishness and selfishness showed itself way too clearly when he met the man that he was supposed to spend time with. The man was 85, in great shape, and in great spirits. George was about 35, so he was a young man. He started off by saying that the average life expectancy of the average American male was about 71, and that the man was really pushing his luck. He was already beginning to harp on the idea of useless numbers and statistics that were designed to upset people. The man told him he felt great at 85, but George just kept at it, asking if he felt an impending sense of death that could come at any moment. The man told him no. He was too busy engaging in life to think about it. Then George started saying that he thought about death all the time, at 35, and sometimes he thought about it so much that it would make him insane. The old man just told him that he just didn't care about the looming possibility of death. George began whining and yelling at him that he should at his age. He ran the gamut of, what are you talking about? What are you, crazy? Don't you have a brain? Can't you see the handwriting on the wall? It's a matter of simple arithmetic. Have you gone completely now that you lost your mind? The old man got up from the table and began walking out of the coffee shop while he was in the middle of this neurotic tirade. George slowed down and asked him, wait, where are you going? The old man said, life is too short to waste on you. George tried to stop him from leaving, and the old man shoved him aside with a laugh and said, Get out of my way! Right down to the last detail, George told the old man, Oh, but wait! You owe me for the soup! He was not only lazy and selfish, but when he was trying to help someone else, he was even more lazy and selfish. He was a completely self-absorbed, overly worried about illness and death, saw the world only from his own perspective, complaining, whining, and he couldn't stand anybody else who wasn't the same way. Someone, like the old man who had been living a long and full life where he gleaned a great deal of experience and wisdom, was an intolerable sight to this young imbecile. Even his friends, who liked him but didn't like his habits, sugar-coated him being cheap as being careful with money. Of course, he flew off the handle when he heard this, too. In hermetic philosophy, there's a term that describes George's behavior very simply. He was a solipsist. It's a person who exhibits a state of mind known as solipsism. Solipsism comes from two Latin words, solus, which means alone, and ipsa, meaning the self. It quite literally means the self alone. Anton LaVey's Satanic Bible accurately defines solipsism as someone who expects others to be as nice and caring as they are without having power over others. The way the Satanic philosophy sees it, if someone doesn't owe you a favor or isn't under pressure to do certain things, they won't, because people are innately selfish animals that can talk, who have no moral instincts. It doesn't bother to talk about the legal concept of Zhu Kogen, which states that all societies on earth have seen the same actions as immoral, such as murder and theft. And this was true when societies had no contact with one another before the modern era. All human beings of sound mind have instinctively known good from evil in human life. Anyway... A, solipsism is a, a solipsist is a person who thinks that their point of view is the only real thing in the world and everything else is not real. They see everyone and everything as being there to satisfy their ego's wants and needs. Such a person thinks of morals as stupid because their ego is like a sponge or a wild animal that they allow to absorb as much as possible, run wild, no matter who gets hurt. And they think it's okay to lie, cheat, and steal. Even murder is okay to them. They feel that if you don't get caught, it's fine. These people don't realize that when adults teach a child moral restraint, the child may hate them for it while they learn, but as that child gets older, they see the wisdom in it. They then can live on their own without help from others, and it all starts bringing the ego under moral restraint. Otherwise, such a person stays in a state of psychological infancy where they remain the center of attention, and that's why they end up homeless, on drugs, or in jail. Not only was George a product of his time, but he couldn't have anyone else showing any signs of moral life because it pointed out just how his life was characterized by darkness. His viewpoint was so self-centered that he couldn't even see the old man wasn't crazy, but that he was crazy. He was raised in a climate of touchy-feely, politically correct ideas that included the idea that morals were relative where that which a person wants and has the power to take is moral, and the general idea that men were not allowed to be manly, and life was worthless and empty by its very nature. That's another part of this idea of Seinfeld being a show about nothing. 
It was also meant to show that life had a nothingness to it, which was so painful that the only way to lessen the pain was to take all that you could from life, and since there was no afterlife, there were no consequences for what you did, except for all the lives you ruined, but they don't mention that. Solipsists are so scared of not having enough money and power because if they were in a position of others around them, they would hurt others. That they make life's work, it make, they make it their life's work to have as much as they can get their hands on. If someone tries to stop them from having more or tries to take some away, they would rather destroy the entire world than not gain more or to lose a small amount of what they have. They see the world in a weird way, which is particularly diseased. They think that they should enjoy themselves all the time, which eventually includes hurting others. And they are constantly in fear of being hungry, sick, or in pain. They hate the fact that they're alive because of the possibility of pain, illness, and death. And they don't want their names and greatness to ever be forgotten. So they live as long as they can to avoid death, but they hate being alive. If that's not nuts, I don't know what is. The fact is, the so-called modern and enlightened New Age people are about as nuts as they can be. They believe in all kinds of fantasies about life which were proven unfeasible many times through history, and they ignore, the, they ignore that information in favor of childish ideas that keep them under control of powerful people who are even crazier than they are. Every great empire was destroyed by such insane people, and those in power are making the same mistake again, thinking the results will be different this time. That's why it's classified as a mental illness. This selfish attitude has caused the modern world to be a shell of its former self, causing everything from a high divorce rate to a high suicide rate. Moral behavior can be assessed simply by asking the question about any action, what if everyone did it? When people tell the truth, respect each other's rights and property, and deal with each other in a civilized fashion according to common sense, which tells people what right and wrong are instinctively all around the world, that harmony is more in keeping with nature's design for humans. When they all do what they want because their egos, wants, and needs are, need to be satisfied, everything falls apart. If people think that that's the natural order of things, well, I need to see what they consider unnatural. Chapter 2. Further Elaboration what else shows the modern weakened state of people living in the world who are destroying the world with their weakness? There was another episode of Seinfeld where George and Jerry had to meet their friend Elaine and her father to see a movie. Elaine hadn't seen her father in a while, so she was using her two friends as a sort of buffer to have lots of talk about to put her old man in a decent mood. Elaine got held up and came late to the place where they were supposed to meet their dad, and this left George and Jerry alone with the old-timer. This showed their weakness very clearly. The old man wasn't always talking, and like older, wiser people, he didn't mind sitting in silence. The two young men couldn't stand sitting quietly, and kept saying things that were meant to cover up their internal emptiness. When they would say one thing or another, such things were often untrue, and the old man would ask for more details such things that they were saying. They were so bereft of internal wisdom and knowledge that they just kept leading mindlessly to vague ideas that were meant to get the line of questioning to stop, but the old man just kept asking for concrete details. The way he saw it, they were going to talk just to fill an uncomfortable silence. The least they could do was answer the man's questions. That's the purpose of conversation, getting questions answered. With such new age weak people, you can't sit in silence, but you can't get your questions answered. They have a tendency to interrupt you when you're speaking, because they can't stand staying quiet for two damn seconds, which is rude and annoying. You can't win with them. They're impossible. He was one of those tough old guys who fought in the Korean War and dealt with the really hard stuff with a minimum of complaint. But a shitload of alcohol. Eh, nobody's perfect. These young, weak guys were his exact opposite. They had never known what it was like to be really scared, hungry, or to deal with anything, or even what it was like to be very poor. This old man could have been born and grown up during the Great. De the, this old man would have grown up during the Great Depression of the 1930s and 40s, so he knew what that was like too. Jerry eventually was so uncomfortable being around the old wise guy, who knew what it was like to be a real man. He excused himself and went to the bathroom. He left George behind to fend for himself, and the old man just stared at him most of the time quietly, probably expecting him something. Probably expecting him to say something stupid which he did. 
These young guys grew up in a time where there was plenty of food, plenty of water, and there weren't any really big fights in the streets that they had to deal with. They were raised in a culture where women taught them not to act like men did, because men were what was wrong with the world. They often didn't marry their fathers or divorce them very quickly because of the new age thing with giving up more quickly when you don't get what you want. Since new age court cases awarded mothers full custody, and their fathers became indentured servants who spent the rest of their lives trying not to be noticed, this meant that they had no male role models. Not having a strong masculine father figure is detrimental to both boys and girls. Boys especially need a father figure to teach them how to act like men as they grow up. They didn't have this. This also made them very bad at dating, because they saw dating as something you do to enjoy yourself at the expense of the woman, and their, their relationships failed for all kinds of reasons. They didn't see relationships as something that helped you grow and become more human with time. They were just another enjoyable hobby, like sniffing model airplane glue. This useless view of reality that they grew up with made them soft, weak, and unable to face many of the unpleasant aspects of reality, which a man's strength is supposed to help give him the ability to deal with and correct. Men learn the moral aspects of life at the school of their mother's knee, before they learn how to read and write. If they're taught the wrong ideas about life that don't serve them when they get older, they can't be blamed for that. But they often can be blamed for not making the corrections to their thinking and behavior, which can be done naturally through learning and living. Women can do this as they get older, even if their mothers tell them to push men around all the time to get revenge for the bad old days. Men learn to be strong and logical while balancing it out with their emotion and intuition, which they learn over time. Women learn to be emotional and intuitive while balancing it out with their strength and logic, which they learn over time. Such new age men like George and Jerry are what the ancients referred to as half-men. They're physically male, but they're basically children psychologically. There are many women who have the equivalent mindset to this, but the ancients didn't have a word to describe this. Women are supposed to be very emotional, and often the ancients ascribed to some overly talkative women the title of the clacking tongue. Men who talked too much were referred to by, the fr by this phrase, and it was considered to be shameful for a man to talk too much, just like now, except no emphasis is placed on this anymore. They interrupt people when they speak because they can't stand hearing wisdom coming from someone who knows anything about life, so they basically shut them up so that they don't have to hear their wisdom, which also allows them to pretend to be smart. They are perpetual malcontents who would still be unhappy even if you hung them with a brand new rope. Such people of this new age character spend their lives thinking that they would be happy if they had something, such as money or power. The fact is, they're unhappy not because they are... They're happy because they are nothing, not because they have nothing. Human nature itself punishes them for allowing such internal emptiness not to be filled with knowledge and wisdom that comes with it. Their bodies punish them for being so lazy. Inactivity causes a restlessness that people exhibit in this case. One of the main things that these people do not do, which would help them feel better, is to engage in useful work. This can be anything that serves a purpose, even for a small moment here and there. You see things that need to be done, and then you do them. Your home is disorderly, you put it in order. You can enjoy that one because you come across things that you lost in your mess a while back, and it can bring back memories. It can also spark the impetus to continue something that you forgot completely about. If your fence is rusty and chipping outside, you file off the rust that's flaking off, and you paint it with rust-oleum. If your kitchen's dirty, you clean it. It'll look a lot better, and you'll feel a lot better to have a nice, clean place to eat. You can also get interested in cooking stuff that you never made before. You can get the recipes from older women who haven't made anything for a while, from cookbooks, or even from TV shows. People are crazy about cooking shows, and it really gets them into the kitchen craft. You can end up going into being a line cook at some restaurant near your house. And you might even like it so much that you go to culinary school and become a chef. Useful work leads to more useful work. In the process, you end up dealing with others in a more productive and enjoyable way. Less time for drinking and planning, and more on how to make things better for everyone. The skills and experience you gain make you more attractive to anyone that you want to date. Smart people like others who can add to their lives, not just people who can hang around. It'll give you more to talk about when you go on first dates, and it has a way of helping you when your introduction's being made very easily with little to no nervousness. 
Someone who has that much of a full life has no reason to be uneasy and has all the confidence in the world even when they're with someone who doesn't get along with them so well. Some people are just too unlike one another, and that's okay. It happens. Each person is like a musical note, and they can harmonize well with certain musical notes together. Any notes they don't harmonize with, that's fine. You just don't play those notes together with those notes. Those notes can be played with other notes that harmonize with them. This is the real goal of life, which is called engaging in life. Things like great wealth only attract evil people that want to take it away. Fame is useless because what does it profit you to have your name known by people who you'll never meet? Or to have people know your name after you die who you will also never meet? That's why fame is the most useless thing. And it gets you a lot of attention that you don't want once you have it. No one will give you a moment's peace even when you want to sit at home and watch some TV after a long day. Most famous people are surrounded by others who say nice things about them who don't care about them at all. They also make all kinds of demands on them, and this is not why they wanted to be famous. They were looking to be loved, not to be hounded. One of the things that all the old-timers used to say was that teaching the young was one of the best uses of your energy whenever you're not working. It even helps adults who are suffering from really bad psychiatric distress due to trauma or loss, meaning when they teach the young. And it helps every single time. It's timeless, and it's always needed, and it's, it always produces a better world when done right. A person's children get most of the attention because it goes toward making them useful and productive members of society who can continue the process of making a better world while bettering themselves and gaining the experience of life. If your kids are grown up and have kids of their own, then you can teach other people's kids, which is a natural move for anyone over the age of 50 or so, along with your own grandkids. One of the things your grandparents are supposed to do is to give your their grown kids a break from their kids so they can spend some time with their spouses working on the marriage and getting some stress relief. In the new age mentality, grandparents make fun of their grown kids when they have trouble with their kids instead of helping them. They're supposed to be a support for the family as a whole while expanding their influence in life, serving the human family more. In this action, Older folks find that they're more busy and more happy in their old age than they ever were before in their lives. If they end up alone with no savings, no job, no knowledge, and no wisdom to impart, then they wasted their lives. If you live only to go from one destruction to another so that you don't have to face the bad state of the world, that's what happens. No old person should ever be alone, even if they have a bit of a temper or they just don't like being in large groups of people. One former satanic priest who gave up his office and became a great teacher of morals and philosophy said in one of his lectures that he hated dealing with larger groups of people, but he loved the act of teaching and imparting knowledge. It also helped him feel better about all the years he spent keeping important knowledge about life to himself. That sort of thing made him feel bad, and that's why he gave up his priesthood in the Church of Satan. One thing about people who are taught as children to see old people as useless and to see learning and work as something to be avoided end up old and alone with nothing. Not an ounce of knowledge, not even a stick of gum. This influencing of people to live only for enjoyment and to distrust anyone older has been done so many times throughout history. And the sales pitch is always the same. Young people are told that the, they're the new generation, they know things that no one ever tried before they were born. They have all the fresh, new ideas that are going to change the world for the better, which no one ever thought to do before them because everybody else before them was all mean and stupid. They're told that they can have all the fun in the world, that fun will never end, they will always feel good and young. Oh, and by the way, there are specific political ideas that you should be in favor of, so you can do all this great fun stuff. So go out and vote for this and that. Often the people who tell them this are part of some business network or political organization, and they end up tricking these young teenagers and adults. Such people who fool younger people into this line of thinking and acting have some of their friends making the same sales pitch to young people who are the opposite of what they turn these kids into. They don't care what people believe, just as long as they fight each other and make them lots of money so they can have lots of power. In the 1960s, this was done very heavily with the idea of don't trust anyone over 30. This sounded nice because they thought that those were the older 
because they thought the older people were responsible for all the stuff that they were trying to change. The problem is, if you don't trust or listen to anyone over 30, you can't learn anything useful about life. That lack of knowledge causes your life to get really hard once you turn 30. By then, you start to notice that you don't feel so young, you get depressed, you're sick from the drugs and the alcohol. And if you have a kid who gets sick, you can't even get a job to buy medicine. Then it starts to sink in that something's wrong. Most of them figured that it was just the system that wouldn't let them live well. And that was a vague and placed the responsibility on something abstract. The fact is, it was their own stupidity and childish that was making the world worse. But they had become so self-centered that they couldn't see it. Like those who came before them, they abdicated responsibility for how they had helped keep things bad by not acting intelligently. Like a child that doesn't see its actions affecting the world negatively, so too were they. Their kids didn't learn anything useful about life, and their kids' kids learned even less than that, and their grandkids are now the most hated generation that this country ever produced. They can't work with others, they're way too sensitive, they're immature, overly emotional, they don't want to do anything at all. They think that they're right all the time and that everyone else is wrong all the time. And this allows them to be manipulated by powerful people who lead them right to their own destruction. Not only do they do what these powerful people want, but they don't like or trust the people whose orders they follow, and they obey them without being paid or coerced. The people who know personally, who try to get them to use, to learn useful knowledge and make things better, they ignore. Because if the, stuff's, if the stuff were true, it would be on TV, which says that the powerful people won. They not only act without sense most of the time, but they cheer their own destruction. Both because they don't recognize that they're cheering, they don't recognize what they're cheering for, and because some of them have become so fed up that they just want the world to end so that it'll all be over. Just like hopeless drug addicts. It's not a sensible action, but when you get caught up in such madness, it comes to seem like the only option. That's why I write things like this. To let people know that there are other options, and that life isn't some meaningless and mindless chaotic mess. The constant bad news on TV is done for the same reason brutal interrogators scare POWs with loud screaming and threats to their lives. It keeps you in a fragile psychological state and makes you very easy to control. This is why many people have turned off the TV and kept it off. It's a very liberating experience. You then come to see that the world isn't in chaos like you, they kept saying that it was. According to these idiots, the world has been coming to an end for 50 years, but for some reason it can't quite finish ending. Once you stop listening to these toxic people and their poisonous nonsense, you can start to live better, simply by finding useful work and doing it. One thing leads to another, one generation leads to another, and it continues constantly. Even a hard life like mine can be enjoyable here and there doing just this. This book is meant to get you people to become un-nuts. It's a little like someone who starts talking about something, and when they stop talking, but you are listening. And when you tell them to finish what they were going to say, the person might say, mm, I forget what I was going to say. And you tell them, yeah, well, unforget. It might not be standard English, but it's fun. And it shows the ability of human thought can make your life a lot more enjoyable. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to help you people unforget. I want you guys to unforget what it means to be human and how to live better. So, go ahead, unforget. Epilogue. The ancient writings of the Coburn Bible say many things. Among them, some people say that they have nothing to live for. It can be more accurately said that they have nothing to die for. This means that they have nothing worthwhile that they would protect their lives with. The book, The Corpus Hermeticum by Hermes Trismegistus, says many things. Among them, nothing that's from heaven is useful to heaven, which is why that which is of heaven is sent to the earth. That's to say that human spirits are sent here to help make the world better and a more moral place so it can resemble heaven more closely. That's why perfection is so often the goal of every master craftsman or every woman who keeps a household, which includes the lives of the people living there. In alchemy, which is the art and science of combining thoughts and emotions to make moral actions in life, the mind of the human being is symbolized by the element Mercury. This is because the element Mercury, like the messenger of the gods, Mercury, has many things in common with the human mind, which is not the same as the human brain. 
It cannot itself be seen. It's constantly reflect, reflecting its surroundings, and it can easily be led in any direction with the smallest force being applied. Mercury is the messenger of the gods, is like the human mind, in that he brought great knowledge of morality to humanity on behalf of the gods. The human mind, along with the human heart, which is to say our emotional capacity, shares that characteristic with the divine. We humans are called the knowing ones, or homo sapiens, which means we are designed to know things first. First and foremost, good and evil, which, is our, internal, which our internal senses tell us by combining our logic and intuition. This is why all Neolithic societies saw the same things as being wrong, and these societies had no contact with each other for thousands of years. Things like murder, theft, rape, kidnapping were always wrong in these old caveman nations because their internal senses let them know that. The common sense among all healthy human beings tells us that there is an objective difference between right and wrong. Only those who have diseased minds, such as psychopaths, think otherwise. The morality of any particular action can be assessed by asking, what if everyone did it? The things that are immoral would destroy every human life and have destroyed every empire that existed. Moral behavior makes everything better when most people take such actions. That's what, imp that's what proves that there's an objective and factual difference between good and evil in life. The divine knows, and we are the divine on earth. What we don't know yet, we can come to know. That is our power. People do sometimes end up being evil. And that's why we get more than one lifetime. Even if you do good, you still get more lifetimes to become better and make the world better. If the purpose of life was to mess this place up, nobody would be unhappy right now. When times are good and getting better, no one ever said, Gee, you know, I really wish I would like to mess this place up. This is another way that your senses tell you good from evil. And when people do evil, bad results and suffering come from it. It doesn't matter if you accidentally hurt yourself while pounding a piece of hot steel or you hurt people by being immoral. The result is suffering. It is meant to teach you to be better so that you can so that suffering can be avoided the next time. Making up for things that you do wrong is the first step towards making them right so you can continue to become better and better the world. Refusing to admit a mistake is the first step towards messing up your life and messing up the world around you. When people do this in large numbers, it creates the mess that we experience right now every day. People have to correct problems together, or they won't improve. One of the alchemists who gave a speech on Hermetic philosophy from the teachings of Hermes, the go Greek god for the name Mercury, was this. The purpose of life is for us to come into the world, which is dark and immoral, where immorality, immorality is so attractive and moral behavior takes hard work, and we're supposed to recollect and gather the light that's been scattered here. This light comes in the form of hidden knowledge in this universe, which we have to uncover or discover. That knowledge of the sciences and arts can be used to help us perfect ourselves and perfect the world. There's a ton to learn, a ton more to discover, and learn to apply in life. The ultimate purpose of all of this is to make the world so perfect that we don't even need to stay here anymore because we will know all that there is to know. Then we can go out into the cosmos and teach other races how to do the same. When all races are perfected and there are no more improvements to be, made, to be made here, then the universe will probably pass into a new form or will combine with other planes of existence. We may just keep it here as a vacation spot or develop stuff for other realms of existence when we need to. Wonder what all that means? Well, you have to first start learning the basics. Then you'll eventually come to that knowledge. There is no way for it to become more clear to you. If I tried to tell you all that there was to know about it, it wouldn't make sense to you right now. It will later. Trust me, I had the same problem once. I don't anymore. It's something that you just have to come to gradually. Get started. You'll enjoy the journey. I promise.